Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here for this uh, controversy right from the Rencontre Dex. So please take your seats quickly. Thank you to those who are listening online also and will address a a very topical subject. We're going to be talking about the social contract. I'm lucky to talk about this topic with talk about programmed obsolescence of the social contract. And with me is Jacques Pomereau. You are the president CEO of a digital uh, consultancy company, Inatum, and Brice Roger, you're the president of uh, the Rocher Group, which is, includes Yves Rocher and Petit Bateau. To begin, I have a question. The social contract today, is it being threatened? Is it behind us now? Is it going to be transformed? So what is the situation within companies? Firstly, thank you for inviting me. I think that everyone read Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, this week to remember what the social contract is. You did it, yes. It's when an individual gives up part of their freedom with regard to the state in particular in exchange for a certain level of protection. During COVID, we saw that there was a challenge of the social contract. Am I sufficiently protected with respect to the freedom I gave up? In the social contract, you need to have uh, rules, activities, schedules, and in exchange for that, you get a wage. But the social contract, the basis has evolved in the last few years. If I refer to the Jean Jaurès Institute, we see that 71% of employees say that for them, their company plays an important role in society. There was a study of the Institute of uh, Companies, Institut d'Entreprise, when you ask them, who do you trust to have an impact on your life and on society? The population doesn't really trust politicians anymore and doesn't trust the state. However, companies come in third place behind citizens themselves and behind doctors. So the social contract today is much more time against salary, the expectation of working in an environment that produces uh, something for society. Also, there are many studies, I won't mention them all, but they say, for example, on questions of diversity, a company that's capable of creating a climate with more diversity, more inclusion, with the safety of opinion, is Two, has a 2% higher uh, yield or efficiency than companies that don't do this. So it's positive for society, it's positive for companies, the economy, and for the people working in the company. So this is changing, the world is changing. We can't stay static. So I'll just give you an example of the social contract at Inetum this year. We decided to involve all of our employees, 28,000 employees, in doing good around us, we replaced financial donations or, uh, that we were giving to uh, associations. And we asked instead the employees to spend one day uh, a year to do good around them in a charity of their choice without any suggestions from management. That's part of our social contract. And I think each company has changed their own social contract. So, Brice Roger, the social contract, you see it evolve, you see the expectations of uh, your employees and your consumers in general. Do you see it changing? Yes, it's constantly changing, to be honest. 
we are talking about this topic in a political crisis, a social crisis that could lead to a real divide in society. Companies must and do play a role, but companies can't replace politicians. This is important to say because if we want to give an opportunity to, poli to politicians to federate our collective, our society, uh, it, so we, we, things are messy enough as they are, we can't make it worse, so companies can't, must be apolitical. But apolitical, does that mean that they don't uh, contribute to society? No, they must contribute to society. They must be committed. Companies are natively responsible. At the origin, if we stand back a bit, an entrepreneur many years ago was responsible for their own goods. In case of a failure, they were ruined. A they were completely ruined, completely bankrupt. But a legal innovation arrived in the 19th century. The uh, Société Anonyme in France, an incorporation, it allowed the entrepreneur to go look for capital other than his own to develop the company. And this allowed considerable progress, and it's a good thing. But the opposite side of the coin is that the entrepreneur, the shareholder, the owner has become an investor, and they're no longer responsible for their own goods, but only for their initial investment. So that raises a question, and I don't have an answer to that question. Can we talk about responsible capitalism without responsible investors? That's a real question that we're going to have to address co collectively. But what I mean by that is with this legal innovation, making the shareholder non-responsible for their own goods, for their own property, responsibility was transferred to the company naturally. So we went to, from, to governance, improved governments, the corporate social responsibility, and now we can be a company, a mission-based company. So we're here to fill a void. The entrepreneur, as they were at the beginning, is, is now no longer responsible for their own property. Is, it more, is he more so with this French status of a société à mission, a mission-based company? I'm convinced. I'm a fervent defense defender of the mission-based company, a French concept. Once again, companies are natively responsible. The f number one responsibility of a company is to create jobs. And you can go beyond this and go look for a, an additional soul to the company. If I look at the Rocher Group from the beginning before this mission-based company status was existed, my grandfather started this, his company to protect nature. Why? It was the entrepreneur speaking. He himself had been through an experience that transformed him. I'll tell you the story very quickly. Very young, my grandfather had always had health problems. His parents were obliged to uh, homeschool him, so it created a strong link between him and his father, but at the age of 14, he lost his father. He, his father passed away, and he experienced this drama, this family drama, and what happened? He went and lived two years in the forest, not sleeping, but he spent the whole day. It brought him comfort uh, and uh, peace, and at that time, he became aware that nature had a positive impact on people's well-being, and he wanted to act in to protect nature, and this is why the Rocher Group has always been committed since the beginning to this uh, battle. So why? Do you need this mission-based society status? It's the commitment of the entrepreneur. It's a responsibility. Is your company a mission-based one? And if it is, why are you making this choice? The question is, do we need to have a label on an approach? And is the proof not in more our actions? If you look at 
Companies where this status doesn't exist, like in the United States, you can have a coalition of companies in the Silicon Valley and technology who voluntarily do the 111, 1% of profits to charities, 1% of product given to charities, and 1% of their time of the employees given to do good around them. It's not a legal status or it's anything that's certified. It's just a fact. And companies can, managers can say, I believe in this so much that I will commit my company and my financial results to have an impact. Why are these uh, labels so important? Here we have regulations that are arriving to measure our progress. It's important to help people progress to give incentives to companies so that they will commit. We know for CO2, for carbon, it's important to measure emissions in our company's carbon footprint, to set up action plans with measures. The commitment is important, and the public authorities have a role to play to channel energies and measure what we want to avoid as entrepreneurs and that is greenwashing, declaring intentions, uh, having uh, uh, wonderful messages, but that are not actually a, a reality within the company. Do you feel, you who are in business, do you feel that these labels, the multiplication of labels, be they environmental or for equality or against discrimination, the, the fact that there are so many labels, does that really allow the cause to progress, or is it a way of hiding behind them? We have this charter, uh, so everything's fine in our company. Well, it's a double-edged sword. There's a well-known label, SMP, Standard & Poor's, that tracks the 500 best global companies in environmental and social aspects. Chevron was part of that recently but not Tesla. So then you can wonder about the relevance of this label. What are the criteria? Environment's one thing. There are the social aspects. Are the employees paid properly? Can they create unions? The G governance is the company paying their taxes in the right place. Do they have a board uh, with the diversity of board uh, members? So the so without objective proof and audits, it does open the door to a lot of greenwashing. Please, Rocher, do you think since you've been a mission-based company, what has it changed for you, for the consumers, for the employees, for your co-workers? I'm a fervent defender of this Société Mission French label, and I think that it's a tool that, above all, is for within the company for our employees. And it really works on company culture. And for the first time in the history, the company culture has a legal support. We talk about strategy, organization. And we can be tempted to push aside company culture, but in reality, a company uh, is are men and women with talent that doesn't hurt if they're talented, and you need to work on your mission, the mission to be there for your co-worker or not. They can decide to participate in the company's work or not, the company's battle or not. The essential topic here, I'm not in favor of maximizing standards, but this Société Mission status gives some freedom with a certain number of uh, limits to make explicit things that are too often implicit. When it's explicit, you commit not to the general public, you're committing to the people in-house. And if you don't do what you say, they will leave you, will lose your talent. And so from as of that moment, you'll lose the energy necessary for the development of the company. Earlier on, we started by saying the, talk about the challenges which are specific during a social, uh, when we have a social environment which is uh, difficult. So, 
Do you think that uh, the employees, the personnel and uh, society expect that the uh, company could be a refuge? Is it one of the last places where you don't talk about politics, where there is a um, cohesion, or whereas uh, elsewhere in uh, the in society, whether within families, in uh, uh, elsewhere, there is more uh, fractured. When you manage a company, you know, 28,000 people, it's like a small city. How every opinion is represented, which is quite normal. Uh, and the mayor has a municipal council, very often has a obvious opponents. Maybe you have some, but uh, what is felt generally is uh, when employees don't talk about politics. Well, yes, because he said it, it's kind of a refuge place, and it should remain one, somewhere where you focus on a social contract. Uh, for instance, I don't see how which I, well, I should uh, comment uh, the, uh, what's happening in France in terms of elections, or I didn't comment uh, in what's happening in Mexico, or Peru, or the UK. Uh, so we're not, considering the number of elections, it's impossible to make comments com constantly. The role of a um, company is to keep the peace in social contracts. I'm positively contributing to society, or if you're doing good work for customers, you will be paid accordingly. It reminds me of the election verse opposite Clinton that I experienced from uh, the inside in Silicon Valley at the time as a French person with no right, uh, voting right, uh, in the uh, businesses and sectors. I saw messages going through, if you vote for Donald Trump, I suggest uh, you hand in your, uh, your resignation tomorrow. You have no place in our company. When you're an employee, you have to do your work. It's a very strong message. And others said it would be welcome to fund uh, support uh, dinner for such a, such a candidate. I think it's wrong to me. Seems I'm European. I have a more neutral feeling about the role of a business. But you can make consensual uh, commitments. Uh, I think everyone wants to improve society, whatever their uh, political feelings. Everyone wants the planet to be in good health, and that is a common point. Greece, it's the same. It's a, ref it's a business a refuge place. At the well, I think it's a tremendous tool that we have available to us, which allows us to work on integration, diversity, inclusion, and so on. And so, yes, it is a very positive element. Once again, um, a company is a collective of men and women who are committed to a common project. And somewhere, you have to remain focused on this common project, because this is what helps the big company to move on. It uh, helps get people on board, people, people, people again. But to do that, you must uh, show a direction, not just manage. And that is why the raison d'être of, of a business is uh, something essential. It means you're defining your heading and, uh, and then uh, to be a society uh, with a mission is royal jelly if a company is honey. So I suggest we take a few questions. Don't be shy. Raise your hands and we'll give you a microphone. Make the most of it. So please introduce yourself. There are two questions at the front here. Good afternoon. My question is quite fit. Who are you? Marco. Marco Baroni. My question is quite brief. You talked about programmed obsolescence. So I don't really see where was his program that it was going to come to an end. It's quite a question mark. Well, I don't agree with that. It's not, it's not going to stop, no. no. If it stops, there will be no more uh, businesses, companies, or industry. We have to fight that, go on moving ahead and improve the social contract. It's between the common project, the collective project that we're in, and uh, the collective, which is the company. 
programmed obsolescence? I say no. Three times no. I would like to add something. Maybe a bit disruptive, but remember that of 8 billion inhabitants on uh, the Earth, only 1.5 who have heard about CSR, the environment, carbon, 1.5 billion know it exists. The others want uh, to have uh, access to drugs, to schools, to health. And uh, so we are dealing with a very limited population in the 1.5, about 400 million feel it is important for them. And at least 400 million, maybe 200 million or maybe 100 million are prepared to do something about it. It is our role as business leaders who are aware of it to, to promote these values. It is possible a social contract in the coming year it's with uh, international competition should become a, back to a more basic version because uh, the international competition in many countries, when we talk about the classical CSR, you come to a company, you work, you get paid, that's all. Uh, let me bounce back on that. That is the Maslow pyramid. That's a, the basic, it's clear. Now, two-thirds of our time is spent to work. I want to enjoy it, and I'm sure it doesn't give anyone. Pierre-Olivier Boisier, Oscar Group, we work in building. I want you to, when you say that the companies are not political, shouldn't we distinguish between uh, politics in a politician way and general interest, because for 20 years, if we look at prospects, more and more in companies were asked to come in to the political wills of governments, and here now with the rise of CSR, we are assessed regarding our extra financial uh, aspects which are linked to general interest in the 80s and 90s with the Chicago School and the idea that the purpose of the company is to maximize dividends. Today, well, uh, sponsoring was not part of our mission since the uh, beginning of the year 2000. Uh, it's an expectation. It used to be the responsibility of a shareholder to say, they're my dividends and I will, maybe I'll use them for general interest. Now it, it, it is back within the hands of a company. And we are expected from that point of view to deal with general interest in, the same, uh, in terms of social contract. It's unavoidable if we do not have an interest for the general interest. Uh, it's a big challenge. So let's say natively a business company is uh, responsible. An entrepreneur used to be responsible for, uh, on court with his uh, private uh, uh, property. So now the shareholders have become investors, uh, uh, no longer have any responsibility on the private property. And uh, now the responsibility is transferred onto the, the, the company from CSR and uh, up to the state has been given as a company with a mission. So I see a big danger, particularly today, is that a company is not going to replace the state. It is up to us collectively to get together to have a policy uh, which is at the right level for France and other markets. It's not the companies are not there to replace the government. Do you agree with that? I think that uh, business is tremendous leverage uh, when you have a committed uh, bosses who are both citizens and uh, entrepreneurs. Say, so I have a way to have a positive impact on the, the planet, and in an international context which is constantly changing, we've talked about standards, we all know that BlackRock stopped their CSR funds because uh, they didn't like the performance. There's a pendulum effect. Uh, and we know that those who have convictions and who have understood that uh, the in interest of a company provides better financial results as well are the ones who will be able to keep to their heading and they are the ones which will uh, be successful. A last question, madam. Thank you. Well, I want to come back to this notion of a general interest. I'm a creator of the 
uh, House of Spain uh, dedicated to, to uh, Spain thing, to Hispanophone uh, thing. I think I used to be a legal advisor within a company. I think we need to start by defining what a CSR is. It's a social contract. And uh, uh, business con is concerned as an intermediary in a way, and as all the other duties have di disappeared, including intermediary generations, I think what we are experiencing today is uh, a shift and even uh, we need to break through with young, young people who have spent too much on uh, time in power. I think there are a number of passageways missing. We need to link the parts of different words, and you can't do it only by hiding behind a label. We're all concerned, involved. Collectively, it doesn't exist. You have to go through structures, and I think that uh, within these structures, businesses are one of them, but not the only one. That's a question. It's general interest is not carried by the authority, public authorities. Maybe it should be carried by those who are the victims of it today. Sorry, just to say, I agree. We have gone from storytelling to story doing. Act, act, and act again. This, this is what counts. Act collectively. I think that considering the period which is coming, there are going to be a lot of acts we'll be able to build and construct. Thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you. And we'll listen to the next debate.